All right, it looks like it's the top of the hour, so I guess we'll get started. Um, thanks to all of you who are joining us today. Um, uh, EAS is certainly something that's near and dear to all of us, and uh, um, uh, Digital Alert Systems has sure been the, the center of the, the EAS world for most of us for a long time. So um, we worked to put this together today, and we have Bill Robertson joining us, and thanks, Bill, for taking some time to, to go through uh, the new product. So uh, we saw around NAB, you introduced the DASDEC 3. Uh, so there's some questions about what's different about the new product. It's certainly a different architecture than the than the DASDEC 2 we had been used to and look at what the, the, the feature set is, what the, the capability of the hardware is. And we'll also be talking some about the um, upgradability if you have an older system uh, at what what's the, upgrade path, how do you tell if your system is 32 or 64 bit to make sure that you you can be current. Um, and also Bill will be talking a little bit about ATSC3 and, and, and the differences of um, AEA and ATSC3 and EAS. Yeah, I think we're finding EAS is still required and um, AEA is, is, is additional info and certainly Bill can, can talk about that um, as well. Um, as, a, as a web session, we have quite a few people who joined, and I really appreciate that. And um, I believe we have mics are muted. So if you have a question, you can type it in the chat window, and uh, we can work to answer those at the end of the session. If we run out of time at the end of the session, we'll certainly reply by email. So um, I'll mute here and let you get started, Bill. Thanks, everyone, again for joining, and Bill, take it from here. Great. Thank you very much, Dennis. Appreciate the opportunity. And again, uh, the a chance to uh, get together. So the big things we're going to do, obviously, just have the little introduction. I want to reference and, and preface this with what I call the three irrefutable laws of EAS. People are going to comment about that, but it, it helps set kind of the stage. We want to talk about our DASDEC product and what we looked at in context of improvements. What could we do to improve the product? What would we do as an evolutionary type of thing? A little bit, uh, as Dennis alluded to, our, our introduction of our DASDEC 3 product line, uh, what that does. We are going to be coming out with a version 5 software that matches up with this new one. And version 5 will be available for older systems depending on the platform requirements. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we also, there's a little bit about EAS and AEA. AEA meaning the uh, in ATSC parlance or next-gen TV, uh, advanced emergency alerting is how it's been referred to. But I want to give a little bit of context because a lot of people are confused by EAS or AEA is going to replace EAS. And that's something that we just need to put some uh, some stakes in so you understand exactly what that's about. Um, a little bit, again, we'll have some time, hopefully at the end for some Q&A. Uh, if, if we don't get to it, type your questions in, we will respond to those questions and get them back to you. So let's jump into this. The three irrefutable laws of EAS. Number one, it's not going away. That's it, just live with it, recognize it's not going away. It will continue to change. We've seen the evolution. I mean, right now we're um, from the original uh, EA, we're already into the seventh iteration, or seventh change of the rules on EAS. It's going to continue to change. You've got to recognize there's a lot more about what's going on. There's always uh, queries that the FCC is going out there looking at the ways of improving or changing or modifying it. Law number three, you must comply. That's it. There's no doubt about it. I did an SBE presentation and one tried to add the law number four it says resistance is futile, but I'll let that go for another time. When we talked about our particular product and what could we do to improve it? Well, we recognized that we had a lot of models. There were a lot of different models, but we wanted to maintain the modularity, the ability to be able to identify or, or put product into very specific markets. Some people might need AES audio, for example. Other people don't. You don't want to necessarily build it, but how can we get that modularity? We're always, when you're looking for improving a product, what can we do to reduce the number of internal components? Um, the more components, obviously, the more possibility for, for problems or, or breakdowns. Connectors are a big thing. Connectors are always, they're costly and they're an area that is a potential service issue. So if we can reduce those, that's great. Looking at the number of hardware options, I mean, what can we do now in software that we required hardware to do? Are there other things that we might be possible? We looked at the audio connection. A lot of people really complained because we used the terminal strip interface for the 
baseband audio. So if you're doing um, analog audio connections and even the AES required a separate little weird umbilical cord. So what can we do to improve the audio interface? Also recognizing that NTSC is long in the tooth, what's going forward with HD, what can we do to generate an HD output or for slates and graphics, that's another big thing. But the primary thing is what can we do going forward? We, we needed to make sure that we had something that was gonna be uh, something that we could use and continue to use in the future. And that's a big thing that we had going with this thing. So really when you looked at our product list, we have 16 different models. The old DASDEC 2 series, 16 different models. But these models were all set up and, and differentiated by different hardware things. The green ones in this particular thing are showing um, the ones that we have uh, that are uh, our cable related products. The red ones are the products that we have that we do, uh, generate for our emergency operation centers. Uh, people like Texas DPS, um, you know, Teton County, Wyoming, uh, all these guys that have emergency operation centers, they do that. So these were all differentiated again by whether they had analog audio, digital audio, but they were also kind of market specific. So if you were a radio station, you would look at a DAS RAD. Well, the problem there is that the hardware, if there were any changes or, or uh, modifications you had to do, for, especially for hardware, it would have to come back to the factory for us to retrofit it. We'd have to do different things for installation. So we looked at this list and we said, man, we've got 16 different models. They're different face plates. They've got all these different things. What can we do? Well, really, we had the DASDIC 2 and the OneNet. Those were the big differentiations between the broadcast side and the cable side. It was all kind of the different things. Why? Well, cable has different requirements than, uh, than TV, and there's a different interface standards. But what we've done is we've really now blended it all together into what we call the DASDEC 3. This is it. So the singular focus that we're going forward is the new DASDEC 3. So there's a lot of different things on this DASDEC 3 that we looked at, and we actually created two different hardware versions of this. One is called the DAS3 or you know, DASDEC3 EL for entry level. That's the low cost entry level product. The other one is the EX. This is our expandable bottle. This is the one that gives us more flexibility. And I'll explain a little bit more about what the differences are between this. The EL is a two channel EAS cap decoder. So the idea here, it's a cap decoder only. Uh, it's two channels. So remember the minimum requirements for FCC compliance is you must monitor at least two over the air stations. So Yale does that by having that. The EX is a four channel system. Again, if you've got the, the additional um, audio inputs or you've got another uh, station, maybe you're doing an AM, FM and a weather, that's where the EX comes in because it, it's expandable. Also notice that the uh, EX is an encoder decoder. So there's a difference between a decoder only model and an encoder decoder. So that's one of the, again, differentiations between it. The EL has a new 40 line by 20 character, but it's monochrome display. It kind of looks the same in these, these particular examples, but the color backgrounds and things are different what we can do with it because the EX has a four by 20 color display. So we doubled the number of lines that we can represent. The old DASDIC uh, two models had just two lines, but now we've got four lines and we've got a color cor corresponding to it uh, that we can do. We also have added this multi-function keypad. I'll go a little bit more when I talk a little bit about the front panel here in a moment, but that's a big thing. They both have this multi-function keypad. There are modular connectors. Again, I'm gonna show you the back panel. We'll talk a little bit more about the connectors. The EL does have no expansion slots, does not have expansion slots. And that's the big thing. The EX expansion means it has expansion slots where we can put additional hardware uh, features into this particular model. So again, the, the uh, new series is broken up into two hardware versions, an EL and an EX. Also, now we can add optional AES switching on both models. In the past, you could only get AES if you were in the upper series models, the DAS TVR, DAS RAD. You had to do that. You, none of the low cost units would support the AES option. Now we can support that option. So talking about the front panel, just to get a little bit more focus on this, we have the front panel speak. Give Bill a second to reconnect here. Looks like he's logging in oh. again. Oh. We lost you, Bill. Looks like you're back. Yeah, sorry about that. Kind of the, the things of being remote here. Um, I, I Hopefully I, I got to the, the point where I'm talking about the front panel speaker. Yep, I think you need to share your slides again. Uh, Okay, yeah, that's the next part. Sorry about that. Yeah, once you once you log out, you're logged out for good.
Am I back? So I'm back in business. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, again, uh, this one, uh, the front panel speaker we talked about, we've got the three uh, indicator lights in the previous model. We only had two. Now we have a, a different set of indicator lights. That four line display is really nice now because with the combination of that keypad, we can use it to display more information. So right now we've got it set up such that you can scroll using the up and down arrows on that multifunction keypad and see information like what radio station to what the levels are. So we've got the ability now without even having to log into it, you can do some checking with it. In the future, we're already looking and considering other things that we can do. For example, setting the IP address when you first get the unit was a fixed static IP that we set from the factory. Now you'll be able to do that right from the front panel and without having to log into the unit, change it back and forth uh, to, uh, to match up on your network. So this gives us a lot of flexibility. Again, that springboard idea of being able to do more things with it. And we're looking forward to customers actually giving us feedback on what makes sense for that front panel display of what we could do. So on the rear panel, this is showing the EL series. Again, this is the low cost unit. And if you'll notice, what we've done is those program audio in and outs now are not XLRs, they're not a terminal strip, but we've gone to the RJ45, which is kind of a, uh, a, a quasi standard, if you will, Studio Hub uh, pioneered this and being able to use RJs for the capabilities of balanced audio. You can do balanced, unbalanced, and everything. The EL, if you'll notice that area here, I'm gonna kind of highlight it, uh, is, is uh, dimmed out. That means that that connector is not used. Remember, this is a two-channel box. So that third radio uh, F connector might be there. Again, it's part of the physical uh, thing to attach the board, but it's not functional. The radios one and two are functional on this. If you turn them on, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of options in here. Again, things that we've got with uh, uh, added uh, additional uh, USB ports, uh, we've got the standard uh, VGA, but the big thing too that we added here is the HDMI with audio, meaning the fact that we have an option where you can turn on HDMI and it will have the embedded audio with it. So the neat thing about this is being able to have that HD uh, slate if you wanna have the information of the, of the uh, unit, even on the low cost unit now can have video output. So if we move from the EX to the E, or excuse me, the EL to the EX, this shows the, the complete bevy of things. So that fourth audio now is turned on. Remember, this is a four channel system, the EX, four channel. We've got the program in and out. This is the balanced audio, um, uh, analog audio on that side. If you'll notice, the um, radio three option is, is there, but AES is also using now, this AES board is mounted in there. It's no longer using that uh, little uh, umbilical cord to come out to, but it you again, able to fan out into that. The nice thing about this too is using this kind of stuff, they're solderless connectors. You can create different cables, patch cables with that. And if you needed to patch them across, instead of using the terminal strip, and you, which you couldn't patch together, um, now you can use the RJ45s and very simply patch them together so that you have the uh, ability to do that. Notice too that this unit has the three slots. Uh, the three slots over here, right now I'm showing it with an, a, the option for a dual network thing. There's a standard single network, but you can add the, the two network option. Here's where that fourth audio, or excuse me, the, the uh, third input board is to add the third, um, and the number three and number four audio inputs. And then we still have another expansion slot. Again, ability to add more things, GPIOs, other functions and features that we can do with this thing. So it makes it really slick in the expansion that we have with that. Now. When we talk a little bit about the audio connectors, there are a series of things for pinouts and how you do this, whether you're using balanced, unbalanced, but it is all defined. What's nice, again, using standard cabling, it's very inexpensive. You don't have to worry about the expensive things. If you don't have the um, umbilical cord, and we've had a number of customers for AES umbilical cord because it was a DB, um, a DB9 to XLR type of thing, if you got lost or shuffled someplace, you missed it, now you can actually build your own. But also the nice thing about these, they're very well known and there is a whole series of different adapters. Here's an example, if you will, of different audio connectors and adapters that you can use to, uh, to uh, interface with this thing. So again, if you're using XLRs, there's an XLR to RJ45, 
there's an unbalanced version there with RJ45s using RCAs. And then um, again, on the AES side, if you're using that, there's the XLRs, in, ins and outs. So again, nice thing about this, being able to use these connectors, they're dense, they're small, and they're very easy to be able to use with that. So there's some additional things on the DASDEC 3 for hardware options. What hardware things we have? Well, one of them we just talked about is the AES module. Now the AES module two, this is an important distinction. The AES module is a true digital switch. It's not just relays. This is a true digital switch. It syncs uh, to the incoming data rate. So again, if we're coming in 48 kilohertz or 44, one, it syncs to the incoming data and matches that on the outgoing side. So you've got a good transition. You don't have any pops. Again, it's not a relay. And this is installable on either model, the EL or the EX. Again, something that we couldn't do as a configuration thing. Hey, Bill, we're losing your audio. Hopefully you don't drop out. Could you um, turn off your camera? Maybe that'll help your bandwidth so we can have fewer audio dropouts. Yep. Thank you, okay. Dennis. Uh, I, will, I will do just that. We'll see if that, that helps. Um, Thank you. Hopefully we're Yep, appreciate that. Um, on the uh, EXP, hopefully uh, everything was understood on the uh, AES module. We'll go to the EA EAS module. That module is uh, the ability to add on the EX series, you can add two more monitoring inputs. So again, a total of six. So you've got four on the base unit and two more that you can add for, for that to add additional monitoring inputs. Um, the additional things that we can do is uh, add more GPIs and GPOs. So with that expansion slot, we can add a eight port board that has eight inputs and eight outputs. That adds to the existing two inputs and two outputs that you have on the, the unit. So again, for a total of 10, now we can do even more on a network basis, but we can't do, uh, uh, we, on, the, on the main unit, we can use the, the uh, uh, up to 10. Now, all of the other things we can do is add additional gigabit ethernet ports. So I showed you on the example prior that there were two uh, gig ports um, that we added. There's one that's on the main unit. We can add two additional ones. These are completely independent ports. They're non-bridging. So the nice thing is that you can isolate data traffic if you're talking about uh, being able to have a management port versus a uh, you know a, a, a port that's going to uh, your um, encoders and things like that for different outputs. So the thing that's nice about that is we can do completely isolated ports. They're non-bridging and interconnect with these. Again, these are hardware options that you can add to the device, uh, and, and that's what makes it very nice. Software options. This is kind of an exciting thing. The radios are now a software option. The main units are really set up such that you can have on the EL the two radio inputs. And what we really determined is by being able to actually um, reduce the number of options that we have in the factory, we can reduce the costs. And so therefore, by just having the radio boards in a standard form and then using a license key to turn them on or off really makes it nice. So on the EL, if you want to add the radios, it's just a, it's a software option now. The same with the EX, if you want to add the three radios, you just simply add the three radio option and it turns on or enables those particular radios. Again, this is nice because we don't have to send it back to the factory, swap the board out, do those kinds of things. MPEG-2 is another thing now that with the capabilities of our current uh, and our new uh, motherboard and uh, assembly now, and using a, a more sophisticated, uh, you know, basically a, a more powerful processor, we no longer need the hardware option to be able to do MPEG-2. We can now do an MPEG output in software. And that's kind of, again, an exciting thing. It doesn't have to come back to the factory for retrofitting. And there's a number of different uh, encoders out there from other manufacturers that actually rely on the MPEG-2 transport stream to provide the audio necessary for input or ingest into their encoders. So not having to require the unit to come back to the factory to retrofit makes it really nice and easy. But there's also the support for all of our other existing software options. Things like our EAS net interface. We've got things, uh, MPEG dash, the, the uh, SCT18 or DVS644. All of the existing so uh, software options are still supported. So everything that you've had in your existing DASDEX goes forward in the DASDEC 3 series. 
there's a lot of other options that we don't even talk about here, but we've got a whole bevy of different things that you can do from a software standpoint with this particular thing. So again, referencing back those three different models, the entry level, the EL and the EX, again, that's the hardware differentiation between these two. Everything that we have from that whole big long list now can be mapped into those two models. So from the old DAS, what we call the DAS LC or low cost series, those are mapped into the EL. Everything else maps directly into the EX, which makes it really nice because we build these things on the different hardware and software options, not based on the markets, say radio versus TV or cable, but really what options are necessary for that particular marketplace. We have now retired what we call the OneNet brand. That is the old series in our cable side. It's now retired. But again, every easily be mapped into a configuration and there's new configurations that we couldn't do in the past. For example, I just said you can add the AES module to the LC, which means now low cost guys don't have to go and make a big step up to have more inputs or anything else. They can add AES. So it really is nice being able to have a much more modular approach to being able to, to, to do these models. So again, some of the highlights. Two input unit is the EL, the entry level. The four input encoder decoder is the EX expansion. It's kind of simple to kind of look at those things. These modular designs that we have are even more modular. We've got more capabilities now than we had in the past. People might say, oh boy, that's it. But it's actually simpler and easier because you just figure out what you need and now being able to, to support more software things it's to do that than we had in the past. Now, Big thing around it too, I indicated early on, this is gonna have a new version five software. So when we talk about this on version five, and I'll take you through a little bit about this, the products are actually starting to ship next week. So DASDIC threes are available. Uh, they're available, we're gonna be shipping them starting uh, next week, and that's a big one that we've got. Uh, long lead times, people talk about supply chains, and I have to tell you the longest lead time item that we had were those displays. That was the, the real long lead time that it took for us to get those things in there. We do have a new brochure that you can get on our website. If you go to digitalalertsystems.com, uh, right on the front page there, the new homepage, we've got a ability to link right to the DASDEC 3. You'll get that, that thing. It outlines the new features, the new functions and everything. And on the back of it, there are details, a lot of details about, um, again, the product form, size-wise, power-wise, everything else fits in there. The one thing, as I indicated before, the audio connectors, if you're using the baseband audio connectors, they change, but it's a really nice, easy change to be able to, to accommodate that with the, the big ones. So when we look at it, did we reduce the number of models? Oh, by far. You can see instead of having 16 different models, we've reduced it down to basically two models, the EL and the EX. We reduced the number of internal components, although I'm not showing it by but being able to take that AES board and put it and marry it onto the, um, onto the regular audio card, huge thing. We don't have to have different rear panels. We don't have to have different front panels. We've used the internal and external components. We've reduced it. The hardware options indicated before, we looked at this thing and said, what can we do? We reduced it significantly. And by the hardware options too, again, some of the connectors that we got rid of, which is great. Improving the audio connection, absolutely. Again, you know, not focusing on using bigger XLRs and everyone hates mini XLRs. I know that from a previous design issue, um, but these new RJ45 connectors make it a whole lot easier for people to, to work with. Having an HD output that you can use either for the, the graphics, even in your control rooms where you can pop up a full screen slate now uh, and show what the alert is. You don't have to look at the crawl things, but you can actually have it displayed. Other people can use that in their, uh, in their environments, makes it really nice and easy. We really have created a springboard. This is really what we see in the DASDEC 3 is our, our key thing going forward of what we're gonna be doing. So one of the things that we did is made sure this truly is a new model. So we went through all of the testing for part 15 for emissions, and we are now part 11 certified with a new certification number for this product. We recognize it. This is, we didn't just say, oh yeah, this is a simple change to the DASDEC 2. No, this is a completely new device. Supports all the stuff we had in the past, but it's a new device and it has a new certification that matches with it. So rubber stamp here, we have approved it. This is the thing going forward. I'm going to continue on because I know we've got some more things to cover and we're going to get to the, the questions at the end. So I want to just kind of continue to go through that. Version five. 
a lot of stuff that we've done with version five is really improve the look. We've streamlined the pages. There's less visual clutter. That's the only way to put it. It is based on our Halo product, which is our device management tool that is a web-based design for being able to do that. So we, we really focused on that, on the, the different things we have on that. Big thing around version five is we've upgraded the OS. In the past, even version four had an upgraded OS, but it was, it was all 32-bit compatible. We have to. Remember law number two? You know, it's gonna continue to change. We have to change with the times too. The current products and, and things that we have available for us in development tools are going 64-bit. We have to go 64-bit. There's a lot of other things in security patches, updates, things like that. So version five is going away from 32-bit support. It's full 64-bit. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. I'll explain that uh, as it impacts older DASDEC units and what we have. But that's one of the big things on version five is we are now moving into a full 64-bit OS. We have to do that to be able to go forward. There are some new email functions, and this is really slick because the email functions that we had in the past, you could only group them by an entire group. So if I wanted uh, reports, I could say, okay, I want this report to go to this group. But what we've done now is we customize them by user. So rather than saying this report goes to this group of people, I can say this user gets these reports. So for example, if you wanna have your uh, meteorologist get tornado alerts, you can actually customize in version five, that's the only alerts they get. They might get TORs, other things coming in, Amber Alerts, they may not get other pieces. So the neat thing about this is now we've got some really slick ways to customize emails and outputs of the device based on the user and not on a group. We've got some additional uh, things which I'm gonna talk about where we've got the We have the ability to make a selection on that, that alerts page and you can look at just the important details of it. So it lets you see more. I've got a little bit more about this on an example here. So this is a quick thing to show you a couple of different examples of version five. Again, you can see that upper part. We've really seriously condensed that area. It's very straightforward with it. Uh, we've gone more to a tab instead of a tab button interface. So the idea too with version five is we don't want to just completely wholesale change everything and alienate people that understand how the DASDEC works. I mean, people will say, well, you know, it's a little bit cumbersome, but the idea was to again, get away from some of the visual clutter. One of the big things around it, like setting up the radios and the audio inputs, it used to be four tabs. We've now got it down to two tabs, inputs and outputs. And it's easier now because you can see what's going on. You know what your radios are set to, you know what station you've got, because you put all that information in there. It's really simple and straightforward. We have seriously condensed this page and those setups for it too. Um, on the right side, there is one example of what the reports would look like for a user. So I've got an email address. I can say, okay, this user is gonna get the weekly report and a missed weekly test report. There you go, that particular. So again, each of these can be set by user. So if there's different features or functions on this, we've got the capabilities now to be able to represent those by users. This is an example in version five of what the condensed view is on the left side. And then again, what the expanded or details view on the right. So what's nice is now I can see, okay, I got a cap input, I got a, an alert, and I can see just the, the start time, the end time. Very simple, very straightforward. If you want to, you can expand it now and look at the details. What are the details? Where did it come from? What source file? And you can see that it's gonna be a whole lot easier now for your users um, when they're looking at alerts or you're looking at a page to be able to see that without the clutter, without all of the information, unless you want it. If you want that information, click on the show event details, that little checkbox right there, and it gives you the full information. So again, very, very nice. We're, we really streamlined this. We also have taken a lot of the text that we had because we said, oh, you know, people don't always read manuals. But instead of just putting it all on the, on the page, what we really focused on is using things like hover overs and other capabilities where you can get details about what an icon is or what's going on and have some more information about that. So on version five, some of the key things around it. It will ship with all DASDEC 3s. So all of our DASDEC 3s are gonna have version five. It will be available for, uh, for DASDEC 2s later this year. Um, it's gonna be a little bit later because we have to work on the, the uh, server that does the updates for it and that's gonna come out a little bit later. 
It does, and this is the big thing, it only works on DASDEC 2s that have 64-bit capable processors. How do you know? Well, there's an application note. In fact, we've got that there listed um, on the thing. We have that on our website too, under resources. We'll get this information to you if you, if you want it. That application note gives you information on how you can go into your DASDEC right now and tell whether it is a 64-bit compatible uh, processor. Roughly, and this is again, very roughly, it's gonna be somewhere where the, if the DASDEC shipped after 2016, it most likely has a 64-bit capable processor. If it's prior to 2016, so some six years ago, um, it probably is only 32-bit. So you're gonna wanna reference this and look at it and find out whether that processor is capable of supporting the version five. Now, if it is not, we still have some good things because the older units can and are eligible for our uptrade. Our uptrade program gives people the ability their existing DASDEC and upgrade the hardware. We transfer all of your logs, all of your license keys, all of your usernames and passwords, everything that you've invested in already, uh, and big things, some of the investments, the time and the configurations, all that transfers to the new hardware. So you get new DASDEC 3 series hardware, version five, and all of your configurations and license keys transfer at no extra cost. So the nice thing about that, you, if you've already purchased EAS Net license, for example, it transfers, there's no extra cost. If you've got the MPEG, it transfers, no extra cost. If you are part of our software assurance plan, there's a discount for uptrades. If you're not, then you know you gotta pay the, pay the price. The version five will be available for general customers, again, later this year at the 495 mark. That's where we kind of set the, the standard for our, our version three and version four. Again, if you're part of the software assurance plan, you're already a member of that, there's no charge. If you have purchased a unit or made a, a purchase order, once we made the first public announcement of the DASDEC 3, which was in April at NAB, there's no charge also. So people that already are getting this, if they've got a DASDEC 2 that we that they, they purchased uh, and we, we sold them or, or shipped them prior to uh, DASDEC 3's coming out, um, that is available for version five. I'm sure there's gonna be some other questions and I know I'm gonna, we're gonna to get to that here in just a bit. Things to be end of life and end of support has been updated, which talks about the DASDEC 2 and the OneNet. So you can look at our end of life table and find out where you might be on that. Big thing again, you can look at the unit itself using that app note and identify whether your unit is version five capable or not. We can do that. I wanna spend a little bit of time, I'm gonna jump out of that thing into another area. And this kind of goes into some other things where there's a lot of confusion. And I really wanna do this, it's great in the context of now talking about a new product in the course with the launch of, of ATS3, uh, ATSC3 kind of in a lot of different markets where people are confused. And the confusion is EAS and AEA. There's been a lot of talk in the past, oh, AEA, which is this new component, is gonna replace EAS. Well, let me take you through that. EAS is obviously emergency alert system. It is FCC mandated. It remains part of your transmission requirements. If you are a broadcaster, that's it. Remember, go back to the irrefutable laws, one through three. It's not gonna go away, you know, it's gonna change. You must comply. It's still part of the emission, in other words, EAS does not go away. In ATSC3 Next Gen TV, it does not go away. This I cannot emphasize that more. The big thing around it is AEA is the Advanced Emergency Information. This is different. This is part of ATSC3. This is completely voluntary. Now, here's the problem. If you look at that AEA, and this was the thing, AEA, Advanced Emergency Alerting, it was the acronym. That was a misnomer. We really have gone back, and I was part of the ATSC3 uh, I-Team and things like that, where we tried to change the name, the nomenclature, so that it wasn't alerting, it was Advanced Emergency Information. Unfortunately, the standard was baked so far that it was really hard to change. So you will see things that AEA, but reference it as Advanced Emergency Information. Again, it's part of the standard, but it is completely voluntary. You don't have to. Look above. The other one is FCC mandated. You must. 
but the other one is not. It's voluntary and you can do things. So what would you do with this? Well, you have to understand too, that in the, in the uh, parts of the, uh, the, the uh, standard, it requires that the receiver have what is re referred to as a receiver application, which means the receiver knows what to do with this data set. If I send AEA data through the ATSC3 transmission, the receiver knows how to deal with it. It has what's called a receiver app. Again, we're talking about um, receivers that now have downloadable capabilities, so you can, you can modify them, you can do different things. The other side of that is a broadcaster app, which means the broadcasters actually send information into the receiver so that they know how to deal with it. And this is a big thing around it. Remember, EAS is baked into the transmission. It's part of the presentation information that you're sending out. AEA is data that isn't part of the presentation per se, but it's baked into, or it's part of the transmission that would be available to that. And, a re, and the receiver side either has to have a native receiver app or a broadcaster app in order to present that. So when you look at this, if you look at the signal path, I've got a program source. This is gonna be my standard transmission. I've got my emergency message sources, national, state, local, these are all things. They're all coming into that DASDEC 3, that emergency message processor. For EAS, I send information into a device, a keyer or encoder that has uh, graphic overlay capabilities to generate the overlay, the crawl and, 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 and duck the audio for EAS, that is there. It goes into my ATSC3 gateway modulator, my transmission chain and goes out. What that does is it presents the thing, as everybody knows, there's my crawl over top of my video. That's it, that is EAS. Remember, again, that's mandated. On the AEA side, I can generate an AEA signal and that can be independent of the program signal and have it set up such that here's an example of a template. So a template is um, from, depending on what the broadcaster app, the receiver takes the information that we send over the AEA side and presents it in a different way. It might do a squeeze back of the main program. And then in those little green boxes are different areas where you could populate. Maybe for an Amber Alert, you would have a picture of the child. There would be information about what the, uh, inf uh, about that particular alert that's there. But recognize too, my main transmission where you see that, uh, uh, that woman there is not impacted. This is independent of the main transmission. My main transmission is still going on. I'm just not doing AEA insertion, I'm, or, or excuse me, EAS insertion. I'm just adding other information. And it could be such that you get an EAS alert and then supplement it with AEA data. One of the key things around it, and this is it, I, I left it in here to, to help understand that AEA uh, as part of the ATSC standard also included this idea of a, uh, in the low level signaling that you could wake up a receiver. That's in there. You can actually use AEA to turn on a receiver. If the receiver is set up for it, it was part of the standard. This has not been sorted out on how, where, and who, what's gonna be, but recognize it is there. It's capable of doing it. And a lot of people are saying, mm, when should I use this? So that is available, but it's really a question of when and how it should be used. So the big thing around it is you can have a combination of EAS and AEA in the same signal path. But the idea is that EAS is in your face. It's not going away. It's the standard that you have to comply to. AEA is a voluntary thing with a lot of other stuff. And, and by the way, we could generate a whole nother hour presentation on all the details around this. The big thing here is I want people to understand there is a difference. And again, how does it relate? How does EAS and this new product that we're talking about, how does it relate into the new and, and uh, you know, forthcoming uh, ATSC deployments that we have with ATSC3? So hopefully that has some more stuff. If you've got some other questions, we'll, we'll take that on there. So we'll, we'll kind of open it up now. I've given us, uh, I think, a, a big window for some questions and we'll be able to do that. So at this particular point, um, Dennis, I don't know if you've got anything, if there's some questions or, or Derek that uh, we can go and I'll uh, open my camera back up and see if we can jump into that. Uh, Bill, I just wanted to uh, say thanks. You did a really nice job. There's a lot of information here. And I think that everyone that attended here will get a follow-up email with a link to the webinar. Um, I'm not sure if we're sending slides or just a link to the webinar itself. And also the, um, the, that email will contain a link or the PDF for that, uh, how to verify if your system is upgradable. Um, yep. Excellent.
Uh, Derek, do you have other questions that were, I didn't, uh, let me look here. In the chat, uh, Brian has asked, what is the baseline OS and how do we perform regular security updates and patches during the life of the product? Uh, good. Um, so the, the base OS is, is uh, on the new one is CentOS 7.9. Um, so that's still supported. There are some patches. We do some of the patches ourselves as just standard updates. Um, we're looking at, at additional things to, to be able to do uh, more security patches. Um, part of the whole thing with CentOS 7.9 is because the way that uh, Linux and CentOS change some just, again, the springboard to get to 8.0 and, uh, and further updates on that. So other patches, things that, uh, that we've got, there's an update to the, to the Apache web server on the front end and, and other things like that. So we actually blend some of those patches already in and we get uh, people available when we do uh, additional software updates. And Zach was wanting to know for the audio over RJ45, is there an industry standard for the pinout? Um, yes, and in fact, uh, let me do this. I'm going to jump in here. I think I can get to the slide uh, right here. Um, if you look at that, this is available on Studio Hub. Again, it's it's a de facto standard. So AES doesn't necessarily say this is absolute, but pretty much everybody, Wheatstone, a lot of people are using this. So it, it is, a. I, I'm going to say a de facto standard because it's so well supported by a bunch of different people. You can see, you can go to Studio Hub here as an example to get this guide. Um, so it's very well known, very well uh, understood. And again, being able to, to buy the connectors already made up uh, using this standard is, is great. I wanted to just reiterate, Bill, because I know I had a question at first, and I'm sure you mentioned it, but the uh, the option slot cards, um, even though they're option slot cards, they're factory installed. So we need to know those at time of order, right? Just wanted to make sure that was uh, um, maybe reiterated. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, Dennis, too. Again, where we've, we've reduced the number of hardware options, which makes it nice, but there are some hardware options that have to be installed or the unit does have to come back to the factory in the context of things like the, the uh, uh, whoops, excuse me, I'm gonna go, uh, I lost my slide, sorry. Let me go back to the EX rear panel. So when we when we have to install these things, network cards expansion this way, uh, if we do another audio board um, expansion or if we do the uh, GPIO expansion, uh, those particular things are uh, would be uh, installed at the factory. So we've reduced the number of requirements to go back to the factory, but there are still a few that we can't we can't get rid of. So um, it, it's true that you'd want to know those ahead of time so that you can order them with it, or it's got to take another circuit back to the factory to get it installed. I know that I always am a strong advocate of the dual network option. Just as as uh, network experts tell me, they like that that ability when you're when you're bringing in external signals and such that you can separate those ports. Uh, I'm I'm a big big proponent of that too. The same thing, and I, I think that that's kind of a another one. Uh, again, being able to separate uh, management traffic, um, iPods, you know your external ones, and uh, so many more people are going to direct EAS net link to encoders. I mean, we've got. EAS net links to a lot of uh, different brands of servers and things like that. And that's to me, I want, I want to keep that traffic separate. And if a non-bridging benefit, I think just to, to keep the, the things um, separated where, where you can. I think we had fanless options in the past. Can you talk about the fan here, no fan here, fanless option here? Um, well, one of the things that we've always done with the DASDEX is we've tried to reduce the number of what I call whirring clicking mechanical devices. So um, the, the main unit itself has no fan. There is one fan as represented here, and that is a power supply fan. There is a fanless option that you can get where we replace that power supply with an external brick uh, basically, you know, again, expand it out and putting a, uh, a uh, external brick in there so that we can we can bring the uh, the power in that way. Um, other than that, again, the only thing we have is the fan on the power supply, and that that is it. But we don't um, we we made it a big thing to not require fans on the CPUs or anything else like that, um, so that 
and the, the unit draws, I think, a maximum of about 45 watts. So it's a it's a pretty low power device in and of itself. So that's why we're able to do it uh, without requiring a, a lot of expensive fans or failures of fans, which is what we worry about. Okay, it looks like Scott had a question as well. Uh, can you describe the customer experience for those wanting to or needing to migrate their EOS systems from an existing DASEC 2 to the new DS3? Yep, absolutely. Um, so in our uptrade program, and I don't have it uh, in this presentation, but uh, the process works uh, pretty pretty slick because what we do is uh, when you issue the PO for the new the new DASDEC, what we do is we take the uh, we we issue an RMA, and that RMA then says, okay, we're going to uh, we're going to take your uh, unit. We want you to ship it, and we we tell you the time. In other words, we don't say just ship it right now. We're going to say, okay. We're ready for it. So as the as the production process goes in there, um, ship it sometime. You know, let's say uh, a, a given a, a particular time, the unit then goes back to the factory. What we do with it is then copy all the logs, the uh, uh, any of the license keys get transferred to the new unit, um, all of the usernames and password file that gets transferred in there. We don't see that, but the file itself that contains all that, uh, which, which is encrypted, goes on to the new box. So that way, when you get it back. It's going to have all that. The configurations are going to be the same. Your usernames and passwords are going to be the same. But then what we do is we take the old unit. Once we've transferred all the logs, all the, the, the and this is important too, because transferring the logs means that you've got log continuity from the time you take it out of service. And this is a big question. A lot of people always say this, well, I, I can't be without EAS. Actually, the FCC grants a 60-day window for taking a EAS unit out of service and getting it back in service. So within that period of time, and typically once the unit hits our factory, it's out there, uh, out of the factory within four to five days. So it, you're you most likely, if you're, you're talking about shipping and everything else like that, you might be down for all of two weeks. But the big thing is, you've got a 60 day window. Whenever you do take a unit out of service, make sure you mark it in your log. The FCC is okay if you've marked it out of the log. You don't wanna just have an inspector come in there and it hadn't been marked out of service. But it, that starts the clock from the time you mark it out of service to when it has to come back into service. So you've got that window. Again, comes into the factory, we take it, transfer all the logs, any hardware things. Again, if you've got an expansion slot or things like that that we can transfer that are compatible, we'll transfer it onto the new box. Then what we do is we decommission the old box. We actually take it apart, send the metal out for recycling, send the, the, uh, the electronics out for e-cycling. And, um, and just basically get rid of the unit. It's, it's no longer uh, usable. Uh, and then return the old unit back, or the, excuse me, return the new unit back to you, and it's ready to go. You plug it in, uh, depending on the connectors, obviously on the audio side, you get it wired up, you power it up, and it's just like uh, your old unit had never left, including, as I said, the continuity of the log. So you've got a log file all the way along since the time it went out of service. And then from Brian, is the is a DAS EOC box still a separate product, or is it absorbed into one of these two new models? Um, basically, the the EOCs are going to be absorbed into the. I'm going to try to find that real quick. Ba, 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 ba. I think I've got it in that one. Um, the EOCs, although I don't show it on this one, they're absorbed into the EX series. Um, and what we've done is instead of changing it and putting a whole red face plate and things like that, we have a, a label that goes over it and says EOC. So EOCs are going to be part of uh, the EX series. They're, they're just uh, configured with the extra software that makes them an EOC. And then for Michael, will this continue to work with the DAS AMC and DAS MP? Uh, yes, absolutely. Multiplayer and and everything. Uh, now, AMC is different because that uses um, a, a different controller. The MC is the audio message controller, so that's different. Um, meaning the fact that is it compatible? Um, you're actually talking about a different product, but the multiplayer um, that works with the DASDEC, absolutely, they're 100% compatible. Again, everything that you had in your current DASDEC, even if you take the configuration of the DASDEC out, put it in there, it will work 100%. Good questions. And the number of questions, it's uh, some nice feedback. So um, it's great.
thought we'd get more. Probably just as far as security, <laughs> I know it's it's a it's a it's an important thing for everyone, right? And so we had a major upgrade, I believe, in version three, where like everyone upgraded. I think our number of people that upgraded to version four is 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 a smaller subset than upgraded to version three. Could you talk a little bit about security and and you know if you're running version three yet, um, what's your uh, what's your main reasons for upgrading to all the way to five now when it's released? Actually, Dennis, I. I my network kind of cut out a little bit. I, I missed your question. If you could try it again. Sure, sure. Just um, we, we saw upgrades to version three very um, like nearly everyone upgraded. I believe that it had to do with uh, some other things that were in version three. But um, right. for those that are still on three, um, especially as security goes, it's usually one of the main things I hear about upgrades these days. What would be the reasons to upgrade from three to three to five, or even four to five on security? Maybe just a little bit more of the security improvements there. Um, well, there's several things. Obviously, um, as we as we continue to go, the operating systems that that underlie these things are are critical. There's a lot of things we had with even um, older things, like Bash and other updates that, that that come out, and you realize you've got to continue to do that. We can't go back and try to repatch old OSs and try to do that. The idea is that we want to go forward and be able to do that. So the security, for example, the new uh, web server. I think we lost you, Bill, just here where we can't hear you right now, if you can hear us. You might want to start over. We heard web servers was the last word I heard. <laughs> Apologies. I'm going to turn my camera off. Maybe that's the thing that's that's uh, drawing too much bandwidth. So I'll I'll, I'll do that. Um, no. So in moving forward, by being able to uh, move the OS, we are gathering all the security updates that are already out there for those new versions. Things like the web server, everything else like that. We want to make sure that we've got those things encompassed. There's other things too, by the way, um, we added in the latter version of, of version four and 4.3, we even have from a security standpoint, the ability to do single sign-on. So where uh, companies are looking at doing single sign-on uh, so that you can secure the devices without having individual uh, passwords and trying to deal with that. Uh, if you're using TACX, which is a, uh, a standard uh, for single sign-on, those are things that we have available for uh, for DASDEX too. So in a network environment, we can uh, support uh, things like single sign-on for more security, again, about a device and uh, individual uh, authentication against um, security credentials that you have in your corporate environment. Okay, thanks. More questions, Derek? You got them all covered. Wow, that's and we and we did it within the hour. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, thanks a lot, Bill. And and people can certainly follow up with us with any questions. We'll send out that follow up email. And uh, I guess we give everyone a couple of minutes to probably prepare for the next meeting they have at the top of the hour. But this was an important one. I really appreciate you running through it with us. Yep. And again, contact information there on the screen. You guys can see that. Um, anything else? Let us know. If you uh, if, if you did you know send a question or whatever else you've got my email uh, Dennis there um, and we will follow up um, as Dennis indicated to make sure you guys have more information about what is forthcoming you can get the data sheet um, and we're always here to, to help any way we can. Okay, thanks again everyone. Great. Thanks, Dennis. Appreciate all the folks from Heartland and uh, helping us organize this together. And you guys uh, have a great day.